Why is Australian cricket so bad? Why do you think the old man Yeah, but no sound, man. Okay, one, two, one, two. Testing one, two, one, two, one, two. <coughs> If you're online, you just bear with us a, a little bit. We're just testing the uh, the sound. So, yes, okay. I'm um, understand that we're okay to go. Okay, um, I'm going to jump in. Good to go, Jamie. Okay, guys. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, obviously, there's two audiences here tonight. So we've got the live audience uh, here at Newington College, and we've got the people online. So. Um, what we've said is uh, if you've got questions with the presentation, we're going to leave the live audience until the end um, and the online audience, you're welcome to uh, ask questions. Uh, Jamie McGregor advises, Jamie McGregor advises me intelligent and sensible questions, which he will uh, hopefully then relay at the end. Um, so in terms of tonight, um, for those that don't know me, I'm Angus Gardner and I will be presenting to you on uh, contextual refereeing. So we'll jump straight in. So you're probably all wondering, um, what is contextual refereeing? So contextual refereeing is being aware of the impact of your decisions that you do or you don't make in a game whilst overlaying the context of the game. So there's quite a bit there. So I'm going to let that sink in a little bit. So it's being aware of the impact of the decisions or non-decisions, which you do or don't make in a game whilst overlaying where the game is at. So it is a it is a topic that we haven't presented on. So hopefully as we go through this presentation tonight, it'll become clear on, on where we're heading with this. So if we use the game as the anchor, so we referee for the game. Uh, the game is, is the anchor. It's why we referee. And as part of the game, we have our game connection. So how we actually um, interact with the game when we're out there as a referee. Uh, and we can look at the game when we're refereeing from really two perspectives. The first perspective is the big picture game. So it's kind of standing back from the game and saying, how's this game going? We have two teams. Uh, one may be dominant. One may be not so dominant might be a tight game, it might be a low-scoring game, it might be an intense game. So we can kind of look at the game from that bigger picture context. We can also look at the game from an in-game context or decision-to-decision -decision perspective. So at the moment, we're setting a scrum and I have to make a decision about the scrum. I've got an engagement sequence, um, 
There could be a collapse on the hit. So the micro context is very much your in-game decisions versus your out-of-game decision or big-picture decisions. So th this really forms the, the basis of what contextual refereeing is about. It's firstly about the awareness piece, and then it's about drilling down to the high level side of things and then down into the, the more micro to decision to decision perspective. So I want to start off with a practical example tonight. So the example that I'm going to use is Ireland versus November, sorry, Ireland versus New Zealand in November. Um, uh, very highly anticipated match uh, of the year, 1v2 in the world. And uh, there are two high impact moments. Uh, now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to play both those moments for you, and then I'm going to park it. We're going to do the presentation, and then we're going to revisit it at the end. So what I'd like to do is when we play these two moments, I'd like in your own mind to make the decision which you think is relevant for the game. Uh, try and remember that, and then we're going to come back and revisit it at the end. So the first moment in the game is uh, three all, 22 minutes in and uh, what's the decision here? Okay, so that's the first moment. The in-game decision was a penalty. Moment two, is it Okay, so two moments. As I said, I want you to park those in your own mind and we're going to come back and revisit those uh, at the end of the presentation. So the first piece I talked about at the start was the, was the game awareness piece. So I want to talk a little bit about uh, game awareness. So contextual refereeing starts with this. And for me, this is one of the key components of refereeing. Uh, the more aware we can be as a referee with where the game's at and what's happening in the game, the higher likelihood that we will navigate through the game and, and get the outcome that the game deserves. So with game awareness, there's there's two kind of key components to me that, that kind of summarise game awareness for me. Sometimes when we referee, we go from decision to decision to decision to decision. So we might have a tackler not rolling, then we might have a high tackle, then we might go on to a scrum penalty, something at the line out. So we're very much operating as referees as to decision to decision to decision. Game awareness comes in when we actually connect the dots for those in-game decisions which we're, which we're currently undertaking. So in that scenario, I just advise the penalty to penalty to penalty. What is that telling us about the game? So it might be telling us that, hey, we've had a string of five penalties against the team here, and so I need to be very aware about where this might lead me as a referee. So a couple of themes with awareness that I want to talk about, and it again relates a little bit back to what I've talked about at the start, the macro versus micro. You may have heard this also re referred to as the dance floor versus the balcony. 
Um, an example of that might be you're at a great nightclub. Um, it's humming, it's pumping, and you're on the dance floor in the thick of it, in the mix. And all you can really see around you is the five or so people that you're hanging out with on the dance floor. So then what happens is you go to the balcony and you get on the balcony and then you look down on the dance floor and then you see another five friends over in the corner, which you hadn't really noticed because you were in the thick of it on the dance floor. So it's that ability to be able to be in the thick of it, in the game, and then bring yourself back out of the game and look at it from a wide perspective. So it's small picture, big picture, macro versus micro, dance floor versus balcony. So what are some awareness strategies that we can use in the game to trigger us to, uh, I suppose, help us with becoming more aware in game? So some of the triggers and the cues that we might be able to pick up on is team and player frustration. Uh, so the big question you might ask yourself is, why are they frustrated? Is this just the team or is there something that I'm contributing here as to why they might be frustrated. The game tempo and momentum. So has this game swung? So have we got a team that's been clearly dominant for the most part of the game and then we've had half time and then they come out and now the other team's dominant. So are we aware of that change in the tempo and the dynamic nature of where this game's actually going? Another trigger might be the number of penalties against one team. So as I mentioned earlier, we might have five or six against one team. Is that triggering our awareness for where we're going? Or are we just continuing on to make decision, to make decision, to make decision without stepping in and, and being aware or dealing with where it's going? Uh, the score, location, whose ball, feed to the scrum. There are other in-game awareness cues that we might also build into some of our preparation or our refereeing. Another way you can build some awareness into the game is to perhaps ask yourself some key questions at key moments in the game. A question I like to use is, where is this game at? Now, sometimes uh, I use this at an injury break when you get yourself a moment of kind of space within, within the game. Uh, it's a great question because it, it pulls you out of the game. It pulls you to that high level. It helps you have that awareness around where is this game at? What's team A doing? What's team B doing? I'd also like to just raise the question, how are we actually using half time as referees? So what are we discussing at half time to help us with our awareness? Are we discussing specific decisions or are we pulling ourselves out and using some high level, um, talking about it at high level? Uh, another question we might be able to ask at half time is what does this game need from me now? So again, trying to get us that, that bigger picture awareness looking in on it. Okay, so I'm now going to, just going to talk about the micro context uh, relevant decisions. So the micro uh, context is about making in-game decisions which are logical given the context of the game. So these are your in-game decisions, your decision to decision to decision. So the best referees make decisions that are easy to follow. When you're watching something from your armchair at home and you're going along with the referee, Often he's having a good performance if it's just in flow and you're following exactly what he's doing. They seem logical. They seem clear and obvious. For me, there's three, there's three components that help us as referees make clear and obvious and logical decisions. One is to read dominance. The second one is to read who's actually under pressure in the game. And the third one is the positive versus the negative intent of the players and all the teams. So I'm going to show you some examples to just um, highlight that point shortly. So first clip, um, just want to ask yourself before you play it, what is the next logical decision in this clip? Who's dominant? And are there any un other contextual uh, elements to consider within this clip? Just to 
Okay. So um, in this clip, it's pretty straightforward. We've got the blues that are clearly dominant, uh, but yet we've got a reset. So again, for me, this is a contextual refereeing piece. Uh, it's reading the dominance of the team and then rewarding or making a decision to reward them accordingly. Another interesting contextual piece within this clip, I don't know if anyone noticed, was the fact that the Hurricanes actually had, um, and for those that are listening uh, in online, uh, you may not have heard the commentary, but it was actually a yellow card just before this to the, to the Hurricanes hooker. So again, that paints in another little piece of perhaps contextual dominance that perhaps the starting scrum of the Hurricanes is not as strong because their starting hooker is now actually off the field. Uh, and we've got the Blues that are clearly dominant there. In this decision, um, I'd like to ask you, get you guys to ask yourself the question, again, what's the next logical decision and who's under pressure in this clip? Okay. Um, so one of the points I'd like to make about contextual refereeing is sometimes we're not going to be 100% accurate in the decisions that we make. Now, that, that might be a pretty bold statement, but in a, in a clip like this, I think it's pretty easy to follow that the, uh, the hurricanes here are clearly under pressure. Uh, the ball's been kicked through. The chasers had to go back. He's had to regather. He's really only got one support player there in that clip. Uh, and we've got a whole bunch of other arriving players that have just smoked that guy off the ball and the ball's coming back. But yet we've gone against them because they may have gone off their feet as part of that clean out. So again, it's about it's about reading the situation in game. Uh, this is just one micro decision within the context of the game. But we can see from these two examples how the micro decisions within the game can have such a big impact on where we actually go to next and, and how the game then unfolds. Uh, just one more. So again, uh, ask yourself the question, what's the next logical decision? Uh, is there dominance? And then uh, if there is dominance, I'd then like you to have a look at the positive or negative intent from the players that are, uh, that are involved in this, in this passage. So, um, again, we, we have clear dominance from, from White. Uh, the ball spews out of the scrum because of the dominance uh, of White. And then there's negative intent from the, uh, from, the, from, the, uh, from the blue players in terms of just picking up the ball that's clearly popped out. They're actually offside uh, and they've totally killed that contest. So, so again, another example of just reading that in-game, micro-decision, but the context around it. I'd just like to touch on um, the selling of decisions. So uh, the manner in which decisions are sold also reinforces the relevance in the game. So we, we've looked at a couple of micro-decisions, but we've also discussed the fact that the best referees are the ones that are easy to follow. So the ones that are easy to follow, there must be something else in their DNA that helps us to follow them. And so for me, it's, it's the way in which they sell those decisions and their body language is a massive component of that. So for me, there's two parts to the selling of decisions. Uh, the first part is body language and the conviction in which you sell that decision. So it's kind of giving someone the impression, how would, how would, how would this decision ever be correct? So I've got an example uh, of... Of, of that. The next part is obviously the, the communication part that backs that up. So the articulation of the picture that you're seeing as a referee, uh, you're choosing your moment to explain it. Uh, and I just also want to make the point that sometimes uh, the signal and the action is good enough. So we don't need to over communicate, 
Um, we don't need to under-communicate. We just need to pick our moment to ensure that we are backing up our decision appropriately. Uh, so we've just got a, uh, an example of that now. So I just want you to look at this clip as it goes through. I want you to look at the body language of, of Walshie. I want you to look at the conviction in which he blew the penalty. Really great body language. He took space. He took time. He used his, he used his arms to create space. He used his arms to sell his message. Um, and some of you online won't have heard, but the manner in which he actually articulated to the English captain was just very clear. There was just no doubt around the decision that he was making. So we've had a look at micro, uh, and we're going to sum this all up at the end. Um, now I'd like to go to macro. So making decisions, so macro, again, big picture, the, the, the balcony theme, uh, it's about making decision X when in a different context, you might make decision Y. So got some examples and some scenarios to work through um, to, to articulate that point. So the macro context is about the consideration um, of the game and where it's poised. Um, for me, there's, there's a couple of key factors here. Uh, the score, the time, and whose ball. So for me, they're, they're kind of three key components or three key uh, elements that, that make up the macro context. So I've got a couple of examples to run through here. Um, the first one is the score is red zero, blue zero, and it's 10 minutes into the match. Blue attacking from inside their own half. As they approach the halfway, a blue player throws a 50-50 pass. As the referee, you're slightly out of position and you think it's probably forward, but you have doubts. So I really want you to be clear on that. You're not in, you're not in line with it. You're slightly out of position. You think it might be forward, but you have had doubts. Are you more likely to blow for a forward pass or more likely to play on? So I'd like to do a show of hands, and then I'm going to relay that to the to the guys online. So in this scenario, uh, who's more likely to blow for a forward pass? Beautiful. So for the people online, no one put their hand up. Hopefully at home you, you did the same. Uh, we're more likely to play on. Um, so I've got the same scenario, uh, slightly different. This time... The score is 65 to red and five to blue. And it's 70 minutes into the game. And blue are now attacking inside their opposition's 22-meter area. The blue team now has an overlap and looks certain to score. And a player throws a 50-50 pass. You're slightly out of position and you think it's probably forward, but you have some doubts. Are you more likely to blow from the forward pass? More likely to play on? Now, I just want to make the point here. We have a different context for where this game is at. As I mentioned before, score and time. So, show of hands. Hopefully, this goes down the path that I'd like it to go down. Who's blowing for the forward pass? Okay, well, that's not too bad. So, so for those at home, we had uh, three out of how many here, Jamie, you reckon? Maybe 50. And, uh, and then the rest are play on. So for the balance of people here, we've just applied game context. Example three, this one. The score is 65 to red and five to blue. It's 70 minutes into the match and red are attacking inside their opposition. So we've just done a bit of a role reversal here. The red team has an overlap and looks certain to score and a red player now throws a 50-50 pass. You're slightly out of position and you think it's probably forward, but you have some doubts. Are you more likely to blow for a forward pass or more likely to play on? Who's blowing for the forward pass? 
Okay, so for those online, everyone put their hand up. So again, we've just applied game context. Our last, my last example, just to really ram home the point. Score is red 22 and blue 22, and it's 75 minutes into the match. Blue are attacking inside the opposition 22 meter area. The blue team has the overlap, looks certain to score. A blue player throws a 50-50 pass. You're slightly out of position and you think it's forward, but you have some doubts. Are you more likely to blow for the forward pass or are you more likely to play on? So we're even when the last five minutes of the game, who's blowing the forward pass? Mm. Who's playing on? Okay. So the majority are play on. Now, this, this scenario we will actually deal with later in the presentation. So the game context in, in this one is very different because there is scoreboard context. It is, it, is, it is a draw at the moment. There is time context because it's the last five minutes of the game. So part of our context here is what is our philosophy as referees when we get to this point in the game? Because we've all, we've all been there. We've all been there in finals where we may have to make a decision or not a decision to decide the game. So um, it's a good example, and I will come back to that as, as part of uh, one of my uh, scenarios at the end. So with our in-game decision-making, uh, we are often faced, uh, as we've just looked at, with a number of scenarios that really um, present to us during the game. Um, some of the key scenarios or, or probably the five major scenarios that we're faced with as referees where we have to consider contextual refereeing and where we're at are late game technical decisions or non-decisions, and I'll, I'll go in and explain what those are. A blowout in score, which we've just touched on, lopsided penalty count games, close games, and decisions to determine the match. So I'm briefly going to touch on all five of these things, and then uh, and then we're going to look at some. Uh, we're going to kind of wrap it up and look at some footage to to support that. So what do I mean by late game technical decisions or non decisions? So what I'm talking about here is your consistency throughout the game of decisions you do make or decisions you don't make. So a classic example of this would be. Um, finding a free kick after 65 minutes when it's been happening all game for a gap in the line out, a scrum feed or an in front of the kicker, as an example. So my point here is, is that if scrum feeds have been ignored all day and they've been pretty marginal, don't pull out one at the 65th minute late in the game uh, because you've just lost the context. Does that make sense to everyone? Blowout in score. We looked at uh, the earlier example where red were ahead by 65 points. It's not about looking for something, but it's about considering 50-50 calls. For us as a group, it completely changed our perspective on the game when one team was clearly ahead and we were late in the game. So what we all did, because all of us put up our hands, is we took opportunities pre pre that was presented for the team that was behind. The team that was trailing, we kind of said, oh, it's a 50-50, so we're just going to go with that. We also, in blowout of scores, just need to be mindful of negativity of the team ahead. So sometimes what we see is when a team gets ahead in a blowout of score, they tend to try and shut the game down. So again, that's another awareness piece and contextual piece of refereeing that we that we can be aware of during those scenarios. Lopsided penalty count games, we've all had them, and uh, and they can be certainly challenging. The first question I'd like to say on the lopsided penalty counts is: Are you actually aware of the penalty account through the game? We talked about in the game awareness piece at the start of the presentation. Uh, being aware in game, what are your triggers? Penalties are one of those. 
in lopsided penalty count games, we need to re we we need to always re reevaluate our even handedness. So, are we being even for one team versus the other team? Uh, we had a uh, we had a Super Rugby game uh, quite recently uh, over in South Africa, where the penalty count at the end of the game was twenty to one. So, uh, on that point, to the average punter or the average referee. The question is, is can one team be so ill-disciplined in comparison to one another? They may well be, but surely as referees, 20 to 1, uh, we need to consider the game context in, in that situation. We also need to be aware of what the player perception is around that and ensuring that players from both sides uh, feel like that we're conducting our referee in a fair, in a fair manner. If they don't feel like it's fair, sometimes that can lead to frustration, which is one of our cues. So our point on the lopsided penalty count is maybe looking for opportunities presented for the team that is behind in the penalty count. So an example of that might be we've got the red team, uh, they haven't, they've got one penalty and the blue team have got 20. So the red team uh, have the ball and the blue player doesn't roll away at the tackle. What are we doing here? Are we going to manage it out or are we just going to blow the penalty? I think a lot of us would just blow the penalty and then we get the blue team uh, where they need to be. So one of the other scenarios we've got is the close game. Uh, when the game steps up, what do we do? Um, I want to just talk about uh, this next point, are we actively looking for ways to avoid inserting ourselves into the game or are we going to let the players decide it? We looked at that scenario where there was a bit of a split at the end where it was a 22-all draw and we were in the last five minutes and we had the 50-50 call. So what's our philosophy in those situations, in those close games? I do want to say, though, it's not about backing out of calls. If we need to make a lay-down Mazaire call or the call that is very obvious, then that's our job. We have to make it. So a couple of examples of decisions where we might say these are no-choice penalties. One might be an intentional knock-on, taking out the halfback or a high tackle. They're all pretty straightforward. Most people can follow those pretty easy and, and, and we get, move on with the game. Versus tolerance levels, say, about players rolling out of the tackle. We may be able to manage that situation. We may be able to manage the player out to get the ball out for the continuity to continue rather than perhaps deciding the match on a tackler who was marginally slow to roll out of the game. So we've talked about, uh, obviously, us as referees not wanting to decide the game. The, the ideal outcome is that we want the players and the coaches and the spectators to turn around and say, well, the game was decided by the two teams. Hopefully, the reaction from the players uh, and the spectators is stupid player and not stupid referee. So I've just got an example. Uh, this example is one of my examples from November. Um, some of you may have seen it. Uh, it's it's a decision. Uh, the context is it's the uh, 82nd minute uh, of the test match and England are ahead 12 points to 11 over South Africa. Uh, and this is the final play of the game.
Bye. Okay. So I just want to use that example because I want to articulate what I was thinking at the time based on my philosophy as a referee. So when we get these decisions, and sometimes you get a little bit unlucky, um, and they happen in, in high-profile games right at the end where we have to decide the game as referees, um, the, 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 the structure that I use is that um, we want our decisions to be lay down as theirs. That, that, that's my philosophy around this. We want the decision to be so clear cut from every, for everyone that uh, there's just no doubt. Now, at the time, uh, what I was seeing on the big screen was uh, certain angles for me didn't leave it as a lay down Mazair option. For me, it was probably clear and obvious, but for me, it wasn't at the number one. It wasn't a lay down Mazair for me. Now, that's where I was in the game. And that was my philosophy in the game. Hindsight, sure. Um, you know, we've got some guidelines from World Rugby on on these type of tackles. And in hindsight, it's completely different. It, it is a shoulder charge. It should have been a penalty. But at the time, um, you know, without having the benefit of hindsight, uh, my, my contextual refereeing was the decisions I do make versus the ones that I don't make. And for me, I didn't feel like it was a lay down was there. So sometimes your philosophy is going to be challenged um, in hindsight, but having something to fall back on for your contextual refereeing is very important. So to kind of wrap up where we started, revisiting the Ireland uh, New Zealand game, putting it into context. So I'm just going to talk through these moments again. Moment one, we're 20, 26 minutes into the test match, uh, and I want to overlay uh, on the two moments that we looked at at the start some game context. So on moment one, which we looked at, the game context is we're, 22, we're 26 minutes into the game. It's three all, and the penalty count is 6-1 against New Zealand. So that's a bit of context we didn't have when we looked at this at the start. I want to then add some further context around it. Um, at the 37-minute mark, uh, the penalty now is 9-2 against New Zealand. Okay, so I've had the warning. So at 26-minute mark, we've got the 6-1 against New Zealand, and we have uh, a cynical slap down by the New Zealand player, but, but no yellow card, okay? So, so some of you may have said uh, at the start when you looked at that moment in isolation, yep, if he'd, if he'd issued a yellow card there, I don't think anyone would have said uh, any issues with that. Black player off his feet. Ireland get the ball from the line out, just knocks it out of his hand. Pretty cynical. I don't think anyone would have had any issue around the uh, around the yellow card. At 37 minute mark, the the penalty counts nine two against New Zealand, and there's still no card. Okay, so obviously Barnsley um, has had a philosophy on how he wanted to approach this game, uh, and I'm please don't take this as me coming up here and. Um, saying it was the right philosophy or the wrong philosophy, that he's a world-class referee, and these are just examples for the contextual refereeing presentation. Um, and then the, the second moment which we looked at was the challenge in the air 
penalty count 10 to, 10 to 2 against New Zealand. So, the challenge in the air. So, we would probably all agree that in isolation, that moment two, the challenge in the air that we've just looked at, is a yellow card against Ireland. Okay, the player's not in a realistic position to contest the ball, and the black player lands on his side. So, uh, that's a pretty straightforward yellow card. But, that's where game context comes in. Having not yet carded New Zealand in the first half for those moments we looked at, is it fair in the context of this game to card Ireland? That's the question. Had Barnsley carded at the 26th or the 37th minute mark, then, yeah, I reckon we could understand that. But from an even-handedness and game context perspective, I think we'd all look back and say, that's pretty harsh if, if Ireland went to the bin there in the context of what happened earlier in the game. So I think Barnsley did a great job of being contextual. He realised where he'd gone in the first half and the path that he'd taken, and he was able to apply that to a pretty tough scenario in the second half and keep the credibility of the game where it needed to be by overlaying some contextual refereeing. So just to summarise, uh, the point of the presentation, just because I know we spent a little bit of time on that New Zealand Island uh, clip for, uh, for, for kind of clarifying things. It's not about two wrongs making it a right, but it's about being aware of where the game is at and the impact that your decisions have on the game. It's about awareness and having strategies in place to trigger your awareness in the game. So I suppose the, the challenge I'd like to throw out there is what are you doing pre-game in your preparation to build those strategies in so you're not just going from decision to decision to decision to decision in isolation. The best referees make the logical decisions that are easy to follow and consider the dominance, the who's under pressure, and the positive versus negative intent. Again, just to reiterate the importance of the body language uh, and your communication to support those decisions. And allow the game's bigger picture to influence your decision-making. Where are we at? What's the time in this game? What's the score? Who's ball? What are they doing with it? Challenge. How aware are we of, how aware are we of these key in-game scenarios that trigger us to apply context? Okay, so that's just a, 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 a parting thought for you guys. Okay. So that's the end of the presentation. So I'll open the floor to to some questions. Thanks for thanks for bearing with me. Yeah. So I'm just gonna if you ask a question, I'm just gonna repeat it for the for the guys online. Yeah. Yeah. So the question uh, was for for the people online is. Uh, in the Barnes scenario, the first moment we looked at uh, when we applied the game context of the 6-1 penalty count plus the actions of the New Zealand player, wouldn't that lend, lead us more likely to the yellow card? Look, I'd say pretty logically most people could put that together and say yes. Okay. Uh, Roger? Given that the second half context of the ball, the Ireland really didn't Given that on the score board, yep. So question from Roger was uh, second half penalty count in Ireland's favour, and we had the context in the air, which was pretty clear cut. So uh, why not why not yellow card? I think oh, plus the scoreboard. Um, I think for the for the point that I noted, which was around what he'd done in the first half. And I think the real kind of clarity that he had around applying the game context. And I think the fact that he hadn't gone there in the first half 
many couldn't go there in the second half. Yeah. Yep. From the, from it, yeah. So the question was, uh, uh, what uh, what things can you do to practice bringing yourself uh, in and out of the game? That that kind of dance floor and balcony. Um, look, I, I think that is probably one of the most challenging parts of refereeing. And and to be honest, I think that um, it distinguishes referees around the world. And and you see that when you watch rugby. The best referees are able to do that. They're able to apply that context. So what are some what are some things that you can practice? Um, one of the things is that uh, we often we often talk about cues or triggers in the game. Um, perhaps if you're working with uh, mates as assistant referees, you could ask your assistant referees to help you during the, the game. So um, maybe there's an injury break on the sideline. You've spoken to one of your assistant referees before the game. Look, this is what I'm working on. If we get a moment and I wander over to you, perhaps you could just ask me this question, where's the game at? Do you know what I mean? So that might be one strategy. Uh, another strategy might be just writing it on your hand. You know, we all look at our watch. So maybe just as simple as like a question mark or something on your hand so that when you look at your watch, you think, oh, yep. I know why I wrote that. So just little strategies like that that kind of trigger you to, to ask a question because you're right, that's the biggest challenge that we face. Once we're in the game, we're in the game and we're rolling for 80 minutes. But pulling yourself out of there and taking those stop breaks are, are really challenging. Um, so they're probably two that come to mind straight off the cuff, but I'm happy to talk more about that at, at the afterwards. Hamish. Uh, so the question was, is in the England-South Africa game that I had, uh, did the final decision in hindsight uh, change my perspective on uh, the, the, I suppose, the order in which I placed on making an end-game decision, which was laid out as air, clear and obvious, 50-50? Um, I think those decisions, because they're so massive in the context of the game, you're always going to review and test your process as a result of having those type of decisions. So the answer is yes. Um, and the answer is still that um, I wouldn't change that. Uh, I think the probably the key thing that came out of that decision is really the clarification um, around how we're now looking at those tackles and what I was looking at in terms of my process during that period. Not necessarily the fact that it was not a lay down Mazaire versus was. So the answer, the short answer to your question is no. It, it it didn't change. It didn't change it. Yeah, Brad. Um, another concept that's used here is relevance. Yes. Yeah. Look, you're right. We, we, we do use the word relevance and, and you're spot on. Relevance, I suppose, sits over this because I think, you know, we, we talked at the start. Yep, we talked at the start about the, uh, about the game being the anchor and the macro and the micro and the game awareness. For me, relevance just sits over all that, mate, because we've got to, you know, our decisions have to be relevant to the game and contextual refereeing enables us to do that. I'm just going to take Jamie. How, how are we going? Yep. Just going to take a couple more questions if there is. Seems like it's it. Anything on from online or no? Okay. All right, guys. Thanks very much for your attention. It was great to come and present tonight. Thanks for the guys that have uh, logged in online. I hope it's been a benefit. And uh, thanks again.